And good evening. It's November 5th, 2024, and we're continuing our collection of discussions in our Outside the Class series. Series from the Bible Project. It's about the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. On the DustyFeet.com, in the Outside the Class section, those source videos are set up for your review. Because the intent of Outside the Class is for you to listen to the in-class lecture first. They would all be found in that source video playlist, right? We, we're going to try to keep these to around 15 minutes or so because we want to make them easy to catch, and easy to catch up on. So we're on a quest, scroll by scroll, book by book, a journey through this collection, but with a fun and different twist on Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet. And before we forget, if you find these kinds of podcasts useful, that's when you click the subscribe button. Those reminders, they just help you. But also, if you think these might be useful to others, that's when you click that like button, because that is how YouTube chooses to share these to more people, if they wish. So in this series, again, we're going to cover the entire Tanakh, the Old Testament. Yet we're going to do it in the original order of this collection, the Hebrew Scriptures order. So it could get very interesting once we get past these first five. Because remember, the videos we're going to be discussing, they're just the tip of the iceberg. And they're part of this learning series, again, that I highly recommend, and they can all be found on the Bible Project website. Because we're going to ask so many questions about all kinds of things. But answers? We'll see. Numbers, Bamid Bar. This is our part five. So here they are. As we mentioned before, we're gonna, they're stuck in their ways. This generation is stuck. Sadly, that's going to be their demise. and It's the end of the generation's ability to enter the promised land. Still, we learn that they're not, they're not content with leadership. They want something different from the direction they're heading. I think they just want to blame him. Sound familiar? I mean, we get to one of those points where I know I've been in leadership roles and the employees, those people underneath, they're challenging, shall we say. And But then we snap. Our reactions, not wise. I mean, they could be better. They're not beneficial for the community. And in this one, God had given Moses to them. I mean, God said, you're my example to Moses. You're my ultimate example. You are my representative. You know, we talk about being an example, right? A representative. Moses. Moses' example is top of the heap, yeah? And here he goes, and Moses cracks. Because Moses goes, talks to the rock, and he smacks it. And he says, you know, you rebels... Must we bring this out, right? I mean, he's kind of throwing himself in. And he's kind of overstepping his boundary of saying that. But I feel for him. Because he keeps stepping in between them and God. And I'm really not sure they, in any way, understand this. Go with me on this. Stop. Think about this. Get a refill for coffee or tea or whatever your beverage you choose to have when you're talking amongst yourselves. Ponder this for a second. Do you think these people at this moment understood that Moses was still interceding for them and that it probably could have been worse? Do you think that they realized what Moses was doing with God even then? So I'm going to interject here, and I'm going to say that sometimes we break these stories apart. They're very isolated for us. We don't connect them. 
We don't look at them as a giant mural or, or an intricate jigsaw puzzle. You know, we look up them in these little pieces and we need to see the intricacies of those connections. And this is one that I think we miss a lot when we don't put all that's happening in the time frame in this context, right? Because this is a very compressed time frame. I mean, we're getting, there's a lot happening here with Moses. Because after all, he's just learned in that story before, right? It, the way they're talking about this is that he ends up getting told that you're not going to go into the land either. So what if we were, let's think about something practical, parable, metaphor, analogy. Let me think. Okay. You, you go, I know. I reacted the way I did because of these people. Because I was working, right? And and we're growing and we're trying to get this whole thing set up. We, They need to see the vision. They're not seeing the growth. They're not seeing the direction that we want them to go here. So I'm just trying to get them to go this direction. Yeah, maybe my last action was a bit unwise. But now the boss has told you that you're not going to be in this position to... Um, expand the company further. You will not be part of where we're going to go and what our future expansion is going to be. Would you continue to be a leader in that company? Because that's a brutal thought. Because people quit all the time. I mean, we have jobs. We all have jobs in our time. And the length of employment today it's the shortest it has ever been in human history. So I'm not so compelled to say, yeah, no, 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 no. We'd walk. But Moses in this story, because this is not a parable. This is not an analogy. Moses stays. Moses doesn't walk. And then not only that, then we get to the snake story. Those snakes, the... Hey, Moses could be saying the people are getting their just desserts. But Moses also sees the snakes. And these people who have been complaining about his leadership, remember Moses has been told by God that he's not going to be the future leader of them when they enter the land. I enjoyed a little lesson that a rabbi taught me once. Part of it was that God constantly protected them. I mean, no invaders. Their clothes and sandals were not wearing out. You don't get other stories of animals attacking them. At least, not until the snakes. These things are part of the area, the snakes. This, it, it's not unsurprising that they're there. But looking back, I think it's more like, why haven't we had this issue before? Because this way, the rabbi taught that God removed his protection from these snakes because they'd always been there. But God, he kept their mouths shut. Now they're open. Snakes could now do what snakes do. I think at times... We want to consider realizing how well protected we might be at times and not even take the time to consider it. Because I like the thought that the rabbi had with this. It may be how it could or should maybe connect with even us. Because I like where God's justice and mercy goes here. It does, does find it challenging to be part of a family of people who died. But if we have a God that's just merciful, I need to listen to God's instruction again. I need to listen to the instruction. Because they had to follow the instruction. 
and it was to look for a snake. But this is that bronze snake that's on the post, that staff, right? Because they still have to look. They could complain. They could whine. They could run away. You know, they could try all kinds of different things. But to get God's help, for God to get them to do what he wanted them to do, they had to look. And there's more to ponder a bit, because it seems not, not all snakes are bad. Probably more coffee and donuts. But this sets us up, right, all of this for the plains of Moab, right? The king of Moab is seeing the rather large group of people that, let's be honest, let's be real, this is a justifiable fear. I mean, there is a mass of people scooting nearby through his land. I mean, would you be concerned if you were a leader? So we have what's going on with the king of Moab and what the king of Moab then tries to do. Because we get introduced to this character, Balaam. He's a fascinating guy. Because we get this prophet Balaam, the king of Moab, he hires him to go and, and curse these people. So we get to this part where we have to maybe do a little flashback, though. Because remember, these are not isolated stories. And we get to the, there's a mentioning of he who blesses you will be blessed and curses you will be cursed. We've heard this before. Where do we hear this before? We heard this with Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12, right? Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to a land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. But here, this, this king of Moab, he, he has a different twist. Listen in Numbers 22, right? He says, now please, he's talking to Balaam. Like Balak, the king of Moab, is talking to Balaam. He says, now please, come. Curse these people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I might be able to defeat them and dry them out of my land. But I know that when he whom you bless is blessed, and he who you curse is cursed. This is one of those weird stories in this particular part of Scripture, because we're hearing also what I would call the other side of the story. Remember how we just talked about the snakes and the protection and what they didn't know? So this whole event that's happening, they didn't know. Does that make sense? Like, like the protection from the snakes, they weren't aware of this part of the story, right? This story is told in hindsight so that the others will know the fullness of this tale. But reading this, we should go, okay, this should cause us then to sit up, pay attention. So we are. We're going to take a slight detour here. We're going to talk about Balaam and this whole event, because like we said, sometimes we miss these little things in between these uh, big overviews. Because I encourage you to go back Read these, because there's so many odd things in this. Again, like I said, it, it should cause us to sit up. Maybe we need more coffee and donuts for this. So there's a bit of a banter back and forth in the story, right? The, the king of Moab is putting pressure on this prophet, Balaam, and he pressures him more than once, offers him all kinds of riches to get him to curse these people. And then there's just a really weird here. 
Balaam goes to God, right? This is a prophet that goes to God. God talks to him. And yet, this prophet has nothing to do with the children of Israel at all. Yet he's a prophet who understands and acknowledges this God. This is the God that's leading the children of Israel, this yod heh vav -Hey. There's more weird points. Speaks to God twice. God answers him, tells him, you're not going to curse these people. These people, they are to be blessed. Say 22, 19-ish, right? So, please, he's, Balaam is now talking to the representatives that have come to talk to him, right? He's talking to their reps. And he's going, please, stay here tonight. I'm going to find out what else the Lord will speak to me. And God came to Balaam at night, and he said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise up, go with them. But only the word which I speak to you shall you do. So Balaam arose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the leaders of Moab. But God was angry because he was going. And the messenger of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now he was riding on his donkey and his two servants that were with him. And when the donkey saw the messenger of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand, the donkey turned off away and went into the field. But Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back into the way. Then the messenger of the Lord stood in a narrow path vineyards, with a wall on this side and a wall on that. And when the donkey saw the messenger of the Lord, she pressed herself to the wall, pressed Balaam's foot against the wall. He struck her again. The messenger of the Lord went further, stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn left hand or to the right. When the donkey saw the messenger of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam was so angry, he struck the donkey with his stick. And then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she said to Balaam, What have I done to you that you've struck me these three times? Then Balaam said to the donkey, Because you've made a mockery of me, there have been a sword in my hand, I would have killed you by now. But the donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all your life to this day? Have I ever been accustomed to do so like this to you? And Balaam said, No. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the messenger of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed all the way to the ground. And the messenger of the Lord said to him, Why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out as an adversary, because your way was contrary to me. But the donkey saw me, turned aside from me these three times. If she had not turned aside from me, I would have surely killed you just now and let her live. But Balaam said to the messenger of the Lord, I've sinned, for I did not know that you were standing in the way against me. Now then, if it's displeasing to you, I'll turn back. But the messenger of the Lord said to Balaam, Go with the men, but you shall speak only the word which I tell you. So Balaam went along with the leaders of Balak. Okay. Anything weird there? God is literally in both camps. Messengers are sent, earthly and heavenly. Talking donkeys. So next week, we're going to wrap up Balaam. More of why this generation will not enter the kingdom of Israel. 
because this is a big camp. And seems Moses still cannot stop them from being who they are. Numbers, but midbar. Sounds like a boring accounting book, right? We see the census at the beginning and we just move on. And yet, we're finding out it's anything but. So, we'll see you next week on another edition of Outside the Class on the Dusty Feet. Thank you.